What do you think of if I say to you, don't think of a rainbow? You think of a rainbow, don't you? I might as well have said to you, think of a rainbow. You see, the subconscious mind doesn't get the don't. Don't worry to the subconscious mind means worry. Don't forget means forget. Now I've introduced to you the subconscious mind. You know, the subconscious mind is this deeper inner mind. You know, it handles and deals with all our memory, all our habits, all our personality, and all our self-image. 88% of the mind. The conscious mind is only 12% of the mind. And you know, it's the conscious mind that we're told about and talk about and taught to use. But the subconscious mind we're not even taught to use. So one of the things we're going to do today is do more work with the subconscious mind. And active meditation is going to be one of the ways that you can do that. Did you know we talk to ourselves 50,000 times a day? Deepak Chopra, he reckons 65,000 times a day. You've heard of Deepak, right? Well, some scientists say up to half a million times a day. Depends how fast the mind works up here, they reckon. You know, if you're talking to yourself negatively, can you influence yourself negatively? Go like that, because it's the truth. And if you're talking to yourself positively, can you influence yourself positively? Absolutely, you can. And you know, after adversity or after trauma, it is so easy to slip into negative self-talk, isn't it? And do you know when negative self-talk becomes a habit, it drives you down and down and down. And you know, they reckon today that negative self-talk is one of the prime causes of depression. So you know what the key is? Listen. Listen to your own self-talk. If you become aware of what you're saying to yourself, then that will really help. Okay? So what we're going to do today is I'm going to go through how I learned about the power of the subconscious mind and my journey in doing that. And then after that, I'm going to do an exercise. And this exercise will develop visualization and guided imagery through a discussion. Exactly what is the meaning of that. And then after that we'll talk a little bit about positions of active meditation. And then we'll use guided imagery and visualization to be able to build our peaceful place inside our mind. And peaceful place inside our mind is that spot that we can go to whereby we relax and release stress straight away. And then, after that, we'll have a break. And the break, there'll be tea and coffee just outside here. And then the next step after that is we'll come back in and we'll go to our peaceful place faster. You see, the first time it takes about 17 or 18 minutes. But the second time it only takes three minutes. So being able to relax and release stress in less than three minutes. That's the next thing we do. Then we talk about the science of the mind. And after we do that, we talk a little bit more about active meditation and what you can do with active meditation. And then we physically do one. Okay? After that, I'm going to show you a little DVD of my brainwaves. It's just a little bit more proof, because I love proof. And then we'll have another little break, just a five-minute break or so. And we'll come back with question, answer, and discussion. And we finish off at 5.30. Okay? So that's the direction that we're going. My son, Andrew, he taught me. My son was 18 years old and he'd had asthma since he was two years old. And I'm talking about a period 23 years ago. So, with his asthma, he was doing everything that the doctors had said to do. And he was getting worse and worse and worse. And then one day, he ends up on cortisone drip in a hospital. Now, you know, that's near death's door. And I said to Andrew, mate, we don't know a lot about cortisone, 
but we're going to have to do something about this. Do something different. I'm going to take you to a different kind of doctor. So I took him to a different kind of doctor, and that doctor's name was Carly Anasundaram, an Indian doctor. And he started talking about subconscious mind. I'd never heard of the subconscious mind at that stage. He taught Andrew how to use the subconscious mind so that what Andrew could do is, instead of panicking, relax between each bout of asthma. Do you know, within a couple of weeks afterwards, Andrew was handling his asthma attacks. The fiercest attack he got was one that he could deal with with just a little bit of puffer, not those strong cortisone tablets. It was a miracle as far as I was concerned. Notice I haven't said he cured asthma. Notice that, right? He hasn't cured asthma, he's handling it. Doing something himself, which is very, very powerful. Then he broke his leg. He was on a motorbike, argument with a bus, and his left leg between the knee and the ankle was trapped between the wheel of the bike and the wheel of the bus. And you can imagine what it looked like. It was shattered. The bone was sticking out. It was real bad news. Back in the hospital. Back on cortisone, because cortisone's the only thing that could work with him, you see. Once you're on cortisone, it's like you're almost always on cortisone. That was certainly the case 23 years ago. The professor, and you only get professors when it's real bad news, don't you? Huh? The professor at the hospital, he said, Andrew, we're going to have to cut your leg off. Good Lord, why, Professor? Well, Andrew, we don't want you to get gangrene. And you have to be on cortisone to keep the infection down. It's the only thing that will work for you. But what cortisone does is it impedes the growth of bone marrow. So the leg won't heal. So let's cut it off now. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Let me go and get Carly Anasundram for me. So I got Carly Anasundram back and I said to uh, Dr. Carly Anasundram, I said, is there anything you can do to help Andrew? He said, well, he said, I can teach Andrew about that subconscious mind and how to use his subconscious mind so that he'll be able to deal with the infection in his leg, with his mind. He said he can also help his immune system and increase the healing in his leg. And not only that, what he'll be able to do is help with handling pain as well. Wow. Guess what? The doctor then, the professor this time, he reduced the dose of cortisone and he did the operation. And Andrew's got his leg today. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that's miracle number two. I mean, that's fantastic. I had to look up and take notice. You know, I am this very left brain, analytical, sceptical person, and I hadn't heard of uh, subconscious mind before. But it was around, you know. It was around. Think where it was around. Sport. That's where we hear about it, isn't it? The subconscious mind. And it was first used in sport at the Olympic Games by East Germany, and that was 1960. And in 1964, it was used by East Germany and Russia at the Olympic Games. By 1968, all the countries who had attended the Olympic Games, their athletes and swimmers, had heard about the new secret weapon, the subconscious mind, and they've started using it. Look at it, look at it today. Every major athlete, every major swimmer, every major sporting team, they've all got their own sports psychologists, haven't they? In fact, it's all taught at the Institute of Sports. Huh? But I didn't know this back then. Incidentally, quite another thing that, that I didn't know at that stage, did you know that what Andrew was doing with his mind on his leg is today called psycho neuroimmunology. That's what it's called. Psycho-neuroimmunology. In other words, what science has done today has proved that we can, with our mind, 
increase the T4 cell count, which is the fighting cell in the immune system, with guided imagery and visualization. And so all of this is taught, for instance, to children in the cancer wards in Sydney that I'm aware of. Right? But you know, it should be taught to everybody. It's so powerful when we can take some action ourselves, tapping into our own inner strength. We can do that. We didn't know about it 25 years ago, but that's what it's called today. Some doctors know about it, some doctors don't know about it because they're not taught about it. Anyway, I'll move on. I was this very left-brain, analytical, sceptical person, and my background didn't help at all, you know. The attitude of subconscious mind was to me, well, what? We've got two minds, conscious mind and subconscious mind? That sounds like a lot of baloney to me. But yet, Andrew had proved it to himself. But my mind went along the lines of, can everybody do it? You know, this sort of thing. Okay, Andrew, teach me. I want to know about it. My background didn't help. I went to uh, high school in, in Alveston and also in Devonport. And from there I went to uh, uh, Duntroon Military College for four years there in Canberra and I came out a lieutenant in the regular army. And from there I went to Sydney University and did civil engineering. And then I'm into the core of engineers. Now, I tell you what, I don't reckon they make a more left brain, analytical, sceptical person than a military engineer. But you know what? It keeps us alive as well. It really does, especially when you work from first principles. Right? And that's what all engineers do. But that scepticism didn't help me. And Andrew said to me, he said, Dad, he said, I think that you better go and see a consultant. A consultant? Hang on a minute. What kind of a consultant? He said, well, he said, a psychologist. I said, a shrink? And with all due deference to shrinks, I mean, that's what I used to call them back then, right? But so I went to see the psychologist. And old Bill, he was a wonderful old guy. And uh, Bill and I shared many things in common. He was, a, he was, in fact, an Air Force psychologist. And I thought, OK, well, he's a military psychologist. We talked about a lot of my exploits you know, in, in, in the Army. I mean, for instance, I went, I went to, uh, uh, after I got in the Corps of Engineers, I went to um, New Guinea. And that was all construction programs. You know? and, and then I went to Vietnam. And uh, I took the first troop of engineers to Vietnam. That was back in 1965, right? And we were supporting the 1st Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment. Uh, and our tasks over there were the, you know, normal military tasks. We are uh, taught very well in this, but we had to work things out. Like, for instance, we had been taught about booby traps, but had we been taught about the Viet Cong booby traps? Oh, no. We had to come across them, we had to delouse them, we had to work with them, and you do all this from first principles, you see, working it, working it out. And then take something like uh, explosives. There were explosives all over the country. Right? Well, we don't want the enemy to get the explosives, so therefore we've got to blow them up, we've got to handle them. Well, you know, there was ordnance from French, ordnance is explosive. Well, there was ordnance from French, there was Russian, there was Chinese, there was Bulgarian, all this sort of stuff, which we didn't know about. So we had to work it out again from first principles and do it. And then, tunnels. Well, we'd never been taught about tunnels. But you know, we were the original tunnel rats. Three field troop. My troop. What happened was that we were supposed to be the cutoff force for a, a big divisional operation looking for all these tunnels in the Hobo Woods, in the, in, in, in the Iron Triangle. And you may have heard of the Coochie Tunnels. And these tunnels, we came across them accidentally when two of our guys were wounded and then the two stretcher bearers were killed, right? Getting back the bodies. 
So uh, after the area was cleared, we found out where the shots had come from. And the shots had come from a thing that was like a, uh, a big, big anthill, but hollow inside, a couple of slits. And that's where the shots had come from. That's when the engineers came in. We blew it in. And there's the tunnel. Now, these tunnels are pretty small. And you've got your shoulders touching on either side. And you're on your hands and knees. And you can't turn around until you get to a, a big uh, uh, turning point or something like that. So you've got to keep on going straight ahead. You've got a bayonet in one hand and a, a pistol in another. right? And then you've got to carry a light. right? So we need three hands. And the enemy's somewhere <laughs> down there. What we actually did was blow in smoke and blow in tear gas, which helped. And then we wore tear gas masks, you see. But we cleared miles and miles of tunnels. And then we pulled out of those tunnels over 100,000 sheets of paper. Intelligence, you see, because we were on the headquarters. And then we had, there was hundreds of weapons and explosives and all sorts of stuff we pulled out of this tunnel. We were the original. Up until that time, the Americans hadn't gone down tunnels. General Westmoreland said at the end of this particular operation, General Westmoreland was the boss of all the forces in Vietnam, he said, from now on, we are going to form the tunnel rats and go down tunnels. Right? That's what he said. Well, we were the originals. I got the military cross in Vietnam, and I got the bronze star in Vietnam. I came back to Australia, stayed in the regular army for a while, then the Reserve Army, retired as a colonel, and then all my civil work was engineering, mining engineering. So what hope did I have other than being a left brain, analytical, black, white, sceptical person, you see? So uh, I was discussing these sort of things with, uh, with my old friend Bill Robertson, and uh, he said, Sandy, he said, you know, there's a couple of hard things to do. He said, one, he said, is to lose weight. And he said, you certainly can do that. Oh, I could, I was out here. <laughs> and no tunnels for me then, that's for sure, you know. And uh, he said, the other thing that is hard to do is, he said, is quit smoking. He said, they're two hard things to do. Well, I didn't smoke. So I worked on weight. And he gave me a little book. And this little book was called The Power of Your Subconscious Mind by Dr. Joseph Murphy. And this book was written in 1953. Do you know it's still around today? It's a fantastic little book. You've read it? Yeah, great. It's a lovely little book. Well, in there, there's lots of things that you can do. And, I, and there was this page on, on, on weight release. No, he called it weight loss. Now that I've just said that, you know, if you lose anything in your life, what do you want to do? Get it back. Find it. Get it back, don't you? If you lose anything. Well, the weight loss industry is self-perpetuating. Lose a couple of pounds and find it again. Lose a couple of pounds and find it again, you see. But the weight release industry is let it go. Let it go. It's gone. So you see, loss is one of those negative words that I was talking about, right? Release is much, much better. So I made a tape with the help of Andrew, with the help of this little book, and I listened to this tape, breakfast, lunch and dinner, breakfast, lunch and dinner, breakfast, lunch and dinner, breakfast, lunch and dinner, for six weeks. And you know what happened in six weeks? Nothing! <laughs> or so I thought, right? You see, I wasn't going to do dieting. That wouldn't be the subconscious mind, would it? I wasn't going to do things like exercise. That wouldn't be the subconscious mind. So... But I'm a pretty persistent person, so what I did the next week was I meditated again, and I kept on going. And do you know that seventh week, two pound went, two pound, that's about one kilo, went. The eighth week, another kilo. The ninth week, another kilo. And the tenth, and the eleventh, and so on, until 22 kilos gone. Well, now I felt a whole heap better, you know. Now I really want to get into this subconscious mind and find out what it's all about. So I read this little book. And you know, in there, there's a couple of ways that you can actually use the subconscious mind quickly. Now we all like to do things quickly, don't we? Okay, so 
He said, what you can do is you can bring down your pulse strength so that no one can feel it. You can bring down your blood pressure. In other words, you can control these things, you know? So I practiced doing what this little book said. And I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced, you know? And then I went along to the doctor. And I said, hey, doc, because I love proof. I said, hey, doc, feel my pulse, please. And he feels my pulse. Good, strong pulse, Sandy. That's good. And I did what I'd been practicing. 30 seconds later, I said, feel it again, please, doc. He couldn't find it. I could make it disappear in 30 seconds, really. And then a machine measuring it now. Take my blood pressure, please, doc. So he took my blood pressure. 30 seconds later, I said, take it again, please, doc. 20 points lower. Now, you know, if you can use and control your body's mechanisms with your mind, then that's got to be good for longevity, doesn't it? I wanted to live longer, so I thought, right, I'm going to get into this stuff. This subconscious mind is really powerful stuff. So I started studying it. You know, and I studied all things about it. I sent for books that had to, had to come actually out of uh, uh, UK and United States, anything with subconscious in it. You know, I studied it and studied it, and I thought it was just so fantastic. I knew I'd never be bored again, that's for sure. And then what happened was that I found a man, right, and I found the subject of accelerated learning by Dr. George Lozano. Now, this was an application of the subconscious mind to learning faster in the education area. And this was right up my alley. I thought, I want to know more about this. So Dr. George Lozanov, he is from um, Bulgaria. Now, you know, Bulgaria, of course, back in 1965, was behind the Iron Curtain, wasn't it? You know? Well, he was working in Bulgaria, and he was teaching languages three times faster, five times faster, ten times faster than anyone else in the world. Well, you can imagine what the West said, can't you? They said, rubbish. We don't believe that. Nothing good can come from behind the Iron Curtain. You know, they don't tell the truth, <laughs> right? So you know what they did? They sent a team of people over there. Lydia Cassone was one of these people and she came out to Australia some 10, 12 years ago. And in her talk, she said, we went there to put him down. And she said, we were there for six weeks and we saw all the things that Dr. George Lozanov was doing. She said it was amazing. And he definitely taught faster. She said some of the things that he was doing, we just couldn't understand. There were groups of people having little plays every day. They were dressing up. There was lots of laughter from them, you know. Occasionally there'd be music, right, and there'd be fast music and slow music. So they'd end up dancing all over the place, you know. Then they're throwing balls to each other and calling out words to each other. And, and if they drop the ball, they race over to the side and put something up on the wall in colour. And there were these coloured charts all over the walls, and she said, it worked. They learned faster. But what on earth has that got to do with learning? What's it got to do with the subconscious mind? You see, the subconscious mind has got in it all our memory, remember? All our personality, all our habits, all our self-image. So all our memory was the key. That was in there. And she said, what we did was we went back to our respective scientists and said, what on earth has this got to do with memory? And do you know in the last 35 to 40 years, we have learned more about the mind, more about the subconscious mind, more about the body, more about the mind-body connection than at any previous 2,000 years in our history. Look at the stuff we've learned. Look at the genome stuff that we've learned. Do you know that they are investigating right now Proteins. They say six million proteins in the body. And when we know all the proteins in the body, we will be able to cure anything in the human being. Bit frightening, isn't it? 
right? But that's where it's going. We've learned a lot in the last 35 to 40 years. One of the things that we've learned, I really use in, in, in some seminars, you know. It's really interesting, I think. Do you know, tears. You can have tears of sadness, can't you? Right? Tears of sadness, right? You can have also tears of happiness, can't you? Yeah? Well, do you know that they have a different chemical constitution? So in other words, we're doing something different to our body when we have tears of sadness and tears of joy. Well now that, coupled with another research scientist, is fantastic information. You see, emotion is memory for the subconscious mind. Emotion is memory. This was proved in 1971. And what, what, what was actually proved was emotion is not only involved with memory, it is the very basis in which memory takes place. Now, when you think about that, right, like you could go back in your mind right now, here's a quick demonstration of it, and you could go back to a Something that you didn't like, something that was trauma, something that was adversity, something that was... Okay, don't go any further. You probably got it anyway. Don't, right, don't think about it anymore, right? But you go there. You've got it. You know what the occasion was. You know what hurt. You know all that sort of thing, right? And I could also ask you to go back to a really fantastic event in your life, right? You go back to maybe when you were riding your two-wheeler bike for the first time, or maybe your first kiss, or maybe a fantastic result at, uh, uh, in sport or, or at school or something like that, you know? There are so many good, joyous occasions in our mind, and they'll come up, right? Now, how did you remember them? That's the key. How did you remember them? I mean, to remember either the negative event or the joyous event, did you have to tell other people about them? Did you have to write about it and write about it again and again? Did you have to make a, a mind map about it? Did you have to do all those sort of things to remember it? No. It's stuck fast, isn't it? It's right there. So in other words, the emotion of the event made it stay in your memory. So now, right, now, if we can remember with both negative emotion and we can remember with positive emotion, do we use negative emotion to enhance imprinting on our memory? The answer is no, because of the tears stuff. Tears of sadness, tears of joy, different chemical constitution. We know we're doing something different to our body with negative stuff, and it doesn't help us feel good, the negative stuff, right? So therefore, we only use positive, right? Positive, joyous memory connections, okay? To enhance memory within the subconscious mind. So that's something that came out of this science a long, long, long time ago. Okay, um, so I was on this journey. You can imagine. I mean, I, I, I loved the journey. And then the next thing that happened was that tragedy in my life whereby my three daughters and their friend were murdered. Now, I want to tell you about my journey of grief through this time. There may be some things there that can help. There are certainly some, some, some positive aspects that come out of it. So I'll tell you about my journey of grief. And you know what? Every one of us here are going to have to go through grief. Maybe many of us here have already been through grief and there's going to be more, right? We're all going to go through some adversity at some time. The key thing out of adversity and out of trauma is learning. Right? What is there that you can learn from this event? 
Because you know, those learning experiences are experiences for our soul. And it's the soul that needs the experience. So, Jenny and Kirsty, they were twins at 19. And Lexi, she was 16 years old the next day. Right? And I'm talking about a date, the 23rd of January, 1987. 20 years ago. And they were living with their mum in uh, Pimble. And a friend of theirs, Lisa, was there as well. So there was four of them in the house. I was living in Linfield, married to Sandra. I had a little girl at that time called Lara, right, who was five, and Ian, who was three. At about seven o'clock that night, I gave uh, Lexi a ring and spoke to Jenny and Kirsty as well. And I tell you what, the mirth and the joy in that house was fantastic. They were all preparing. It was a Friday night. And they were all preparing for the long weekend to go camping. And we taught them camping, so I was really pleased with that, you know. And uh, they were going to go and have spend, uh, you know, Australia Day, 26th of January. And, uh, and a group of people were going to come up and join them, and they were all going to go camping. Well... That was fantastic, you know. And so I spoke to all three girls. And in retrospect, I'm so glad I did. Right? Because at 10 past nine that night, Richard Madrell arrived at the door and uh, he professed his love for Jenny. And Jenny, of course, had not had anything to do with him for 12 months. She wanted to keep him away. But he arrives at the door and shoots her. And then shot... Kirsty, and then shot Lisa, and then shot Lexi. All over in 10 minutes. The police hammered on my door about 2 o'clock in the morning and told me what had happened. And my first reaction was, impossible. I don't believe that. I only spoke to them a couple of hours ago. And then I went off into guns, Shotgun, you say? Come on. With a shotgun, you've got to reload it, reload it, reload it. One or two of them are going to run away. They're going to get away. Surely not all four of them, not all three of my girls on the way in the police car. Right? I was still arguing with the police. Right? They were taking me to their house. And do you... You know, have you seen their bodies? Oh, you haven't been there. You've only been told about this on the radio, eh? So you don't really know this for sure. Always thinking of hoping, you know, thinking that it's not true. And then a little bit of doubt would come in. And it would be like this. God, how could you let this happen? No, 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 you haven't let it happen. It's okay. But if you have, what have the girls done? What have they done to deserve this, for goodness sake? There is no God. And so that's where my denial phase started. I arrived at the house and uh, the girl's mother, Bev, and I are holding each other. We're, we're shaking. We're crying. And their bodies are being brought down out of the house. So we knew it was true. That's when shock started. I think that was the beginning of shock. And you know, shock was a strange thing for me. It really was. You know, I was like a zombie a lot of the time. I was unable to think. You know, I never even went back into my office in the city. And I had a um, a partnership in the city. Never went back there. I couldn't face it. It wasn't a decision. I couldn't think about it. You know, the zombie-like state I'm talking about is, is like the state of... Um, you, you may have seen uh, war films, right, whereby someone's got shell shock and they're like frozen. They don't know where the friendly forces are. They don't know where the they don't know where their mates are. They don't know who their mates are. Even they don't they don't uh, they don't know where the enemy is. They don't know where their pit is. They're a bit of a nuisance. 
You've got to go out and take them by the hand and bring them back in. Right? And that can be dangerous. That kind of shock, just like a zombie. And then I'd come out of being like a zombie and I'd think about hatred thoughts and anger thoughts and revenge thoughts and this would consume me. And then I'd go back into being a zombie again. You can take the kids out today. Kids, what, where, out, you know. Couldn't think. And then hatred, anger and revenge until the hatred, anger and revenge were such a part of me that they were habits within me. I had two things that helped me. Two things. One was, I had a group of people around me that kept me talking. Kept me talking, kept me talking, kept me talking, kept me talking. What did we talk about? We talked about everything. We talked about my life with the girls, my life without the girls. We talked about the girls. We talked about me. We talked about my family. We talked about my family before. We talked about every possible thing that you can think of. Right? We talked. You see, the thing is, if you don't talk about things, what do you tend to do? That's right, isn't it? Bottle it up. Right? Push it down. Bottle it up, push it down, keep it internal. The conscious mind doesn't handle it anymore. But which mind is handling it now? The subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind is like the dream mind as well. So now the subconscious mind has got to handle it. How does it do that? Hot sweats? nightmares, unexplained anger, irrational action. What have I just described? Post-traumatic stress disorder, haven't I? PTSD, that's what I've just described. And you know, a lot of it we do to ourselves. A lot of it. And we've learned a lot from our Vietnam veterans, haven't we? I mean, from the Vietnam veterans coming back, Right? We came back, and when we came back, we were coming back at midnight, wearing civvy clothes so no one would recognise us, slinking into the country. Don't congregate in groups, guys. Don't talk about this. And then we were given advice. Forget about it. Get on with your life, you know? Don't, do, don't even talk about it. You know, all this sort of thing. Well, of course, this, we now know, is completely the wrong thing to do. So... That's where it started. But you know, we now know that all forces, right? All forces. Second World War, First World War, Korean War, all wars. But not only that. What about things like, happens to us daily, like, like accidents, like knifings, like car accidents, like, what about divorce? I mean, divorce can be huge. Post-traumatic stress disorder is amongst us. And one of the key things to do is to talk about it. Talk about it. We can take a leading role here, right? Other than the counsellors that are in our society today, we can take a leading role by making sure we talk to our friends. Nag them until they start to talk about it, right? They'll thank you one day. Do you know in the Australian forces in Iraq, Australian forces in uh, Timor, and Australian forces in Afghanistan, we've got psychologists and we've got counsellors over there, right? Hopefully to nip PTSD in the bud, right? Get to the soldiers straight away. A sensible strategy, right? That's what we're doing. Well, that's how the subconscious mind handles it. So, I was lucky. The other thing I had was meditation as taught to me by my young son, right, Andrew? Wow, we learn a lot from our children, don't we? Yeah. And Andrew taught me meditation, and I was meditating. Endeavouring to get some sort of, I suppose, peace, some sort of clarity, you know, that sort of thing. 
And I knew it was good for relaxation, stress release, anxiousness, you know, all that sort of thing. I knew all that. So I did it. And do you know what? I got the greatest wake-up call that you could ever, ever get. It was like a crash across the head. Huh? This was it. Hey, if you persist in being hateful and angry and revengeful, you're going to end up like that. Wow. Wow. In other words, if I talk to myself, 65,000 times a day, then I am going to be another victim. And who has done it to me? Me, haven't I? I've done it to myself. So, I did some work on this. And I changed that question that I'd been asking myself. Why the girls? Why me, their dad? You know, if you ask yourself a question, any question, what do you get? Tell me what you get. An answer. Yeah, that's right. An answer. You get an answer, don't you? Ask yourself a question, you get an answer. If you ask yourself the wrong question, what do you get? The wrong answer. I tell you what, that's the wrong question. Because you know where your mind goes? I think about it. I'll rephrase the question. What have the girls done to deserve this? What have I done to deserve this? And of course then the answers come up. All the negative answers in the world. You've been a rotten dad. You should never have got divorced. You could have been at home. You could have prevented this. In other words... I'm blaming myself, aren't I? Right? It's happening. So how am I beginning to feel? Guilty. But it wasn't just that. It was, you know, everything in my life that I've ever done wrong came up for me. And I've been no angel, so a lot of things came up, you know, right back to being a kid. You stole cigarettes from your mum and smoked them when you were nine. You Stole money out of the cookie jar. Huh? And so I am feeling rotten and guilty. Right? And who's done it to me? Me, haven't I? I've done it to myself. You see, that's the wrong question. Okay. Why not me? Stick a knot in front of there. That's a pretty hard question to ask, isn't it? Why not me? Hey? Well, let's rephrase that too. What is there that I can learn from this event? What is there that I can learn and pass on to others? What is there that I can learn for myself from this? That's a better question. It's a positive question. A positive question will lead to positive answers. Right? So remember that. Any time we're going through trauma or adversity, it is worthwhile to ask that question, what is there that I can learn from this event? Do not go down that guilt road. And if you do, every now and again, it happens, right? It happens. And you say, ah, I'm not going down there. I'm not going to feel guilty. I don't want to do that. This is what I say to myself. Now that I know more, right, I'll do better next time. Right? Or now that I've learnt more in my life, I'll do better next time. That's a good way of handling it. Because, you know, guilt leads to blame. Blame leads to judgments. And none of them are any good for us. Right? None of them. So that was one thing I really worked on. And then I worked in meditation. Changing the hatred and anger and revenge. Right? They were habits within me right now. And I got some help. And in active meditation, I changed hatred, anger, and revenge into acceptance and letting go. Into unconditional love. I didn't even know the meaning of the word at that time. And then forgiveness. Wow, forgiveness. 
And you know, I just want to say a couple of quick things about forgiveness. Forgiveness is for the forgiver, not for the forgiven. Right? So forgiveness is for me, not for the other person. Right? Forgiveness is also a very personal thing. You keep it to yourself. Right? In my case, I haven't kept it to myself. But you know, if you're doing a process of forgiveness in meditation, right, then who else knows about it besides yourself? And perhaps your maker. That's all. Right? Forgiveness is a very personal thing. The reason I tell other people about it is because it's one of the subjects I teach about. Forgiveness. So, forgiveness is for the forgiver, not for the forgiven. And there's one more thing. Forgiveness never condones the event. It never gives anybody permission to go out and do it again. Well, after I'd worked on all this meditation, I then went through into that spot inside my mind that I would say would be inner peace. How did I know that? Because I was ready to get on with my life again. I was ready to work again. That's what I knew. And you know what? I did that analytical bit then. I'm a very good analyzer, I can tell you. Left brain as are, right? So I analyzed. How come? What have I just done? Well, I've just been working in the theta brainwave state. That's the meditation state, and I'll tell you something more about that soon. So I've been working in the theta meditation state, changing hatred, anger, and revenge into acceptance, love, and forgiveness. Active meditation, yes. Oh, that's the same way I uh, got new weight release habits and took off 22 kilos. Yes, that's right. So theta brainwave state, but hang on. I'm using the subconscious mind deliberately then in meditation. Yes, that's right. How come? Well, because as soon as you relax, you're into the subconscious mind. You see, what happens is that there's a filter in the center of our head in our limbic system which opens up. It's known as the reticular activating system. And this opens up and we can, with relaxation, get through into the subconscious mind and start communicating with the subconscious. Right. Okay, well, I know all about that. But you know what? I also can do things in 30 seconds. Yeah. I can uh, bring down the strength of my pulse. I can bring down my blood pressure. I, can, I knew a system of uh, focusing uh, very fast, very easily, very, and relaxation in 30 seconds. I also had worked on a system of goals doing goals in the subconscious mind in 30 seconds. That's not the theta state. No, that's not theta. That's the alpha brainwave state. All right. So in other words, I can use both the alpha state and the theta state to work with the subconscious mind. Yes, deliberately. Wow. Well, why doesn't everyone do this? Why isn't this taught? You know? And so that was when I resolved to work in this area, right? And I started, I, I honestly, I, I started doing every possible thing I could, reading every book, doing every seminar, any word, every time there was a seminar that mentioned subconscious, I was there, right? I really was. And, and uh, I, I uh, worked at it for a couple of years. I, I finished up in the United States and I was there for six weeks doing a seminar. It was a facilitation seminar. Had to be a facilitator, right? And what happened was that uh, there was a man in this seminar that came and presented to 65 people in the room and he said that he'll teach us about the subconscious mind and my ears really pricked up, you know? His name was Stephen Snyder and you know what he did? He taught everybody in the room how to relax and release stress in less than 30 seconds, right? And he taught them all in three hours. Now, you know how long it had taken me? 12 months. <laughs> 12 months, and yet here's this guy teaching it in three hours. And I thought, wow, this guy's fantastic. I want to work with him, and I did, right? And so I brought him to Australia, and, and we did some 22 seminars together, and we did a lot of really good work. And then I went on my own. 
So this is the 18th year of being on my own. I've done hundreds of seminars, thousands nearly now. And, and I love doing them. And, you know, part of my real goal right, in life is to have people aware of the power of the subconscious mind and then have the tools to be able to use the subconscious mind deliberately. And to be able to do that, I've had a lot of help with a few books. And uh, these books, um, they're around. First one I want to show you is No Need for Heroes. Now you know, No Need for Heroes has got nothing whatsoever to do with this subject. Right? You know what it's about? It's about Vietnam. Right? So it's about uh, what my soldiers got up to, it's three field troop uh, in, in Vietnam. And then uh, the next one is Peace of Mind. There's over a hundred thousand of these books out there. Right? And it's also published in Indonesia and there's many more there as well. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, a book which is about doing things 30 seconds at a time. Right? So this is the fast way of using the subconscious mind. So this is about alpha. right? And then this book here is called Switch On to Your Inner Strength. Now Switch On to Your Inner Strength is uh, more about meditation, quite a bit more about my own journey in it, but uh, working with things like uh, pain release and healing and working with things like creativity and forgiveness. That's what this book is about. Okay, And then... This book, ah, this is when I went on that little journey about study. And you know, student steps to success. So this is about accelerated learning. And the forward of this book is done by um, Professor David Smith. He was the professor of education at Sydney University. Right? And uh, it's a really interesting book, you know. When you have a look at it, um, uh, there's two books. One on the left-hand side is for the left brain. And the other one, on the right hand side, is for the right brain, right? And when you look at the numbering, oh, page 101, page 101, ah, oh, okay. And then page 131, 131, you see? So it's two books in there. And you can choose which side of the brain you want to use, right, to get the information. And then this one here is called Creating Happiness Intentionally, right? Notice C-H-I, G. Using your own energy to be able to determine your life's purpose and all the goals that go towards your life's purpose. Okay? That's what this book's about. I do a five-day live-in seminar. 